You know, week after week, day after day, and in fact, television commercial after television commercial, we are being reminded of how ugly and dirty politics really is, aren't we? I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't wait till we're done with this election and I don't got to watch all these, these commercials. Well, you know, as we move to D-Day this next Tuesday, we're going to see the political candidates throwing their hardest punches. I mean, you probably haven't seen anything until you see what's going to come out tonight and, and Monday and all day on Tuesday. Uh, but lest you think they're just punching wildly to weaken their opponents, I think we need to think again. You know, the hard-hitting punches are designed to exploit their opponents' weaknesses. And that's not a a new strategy in battle. In fact, for anybody that has ever boxed or wrestled or played any kind of competitive sports, you know that the way to win is to exploit your enemies or your opponents' weaknesses. You know, you don't want to play harder, you want to play smarter. Now, Satan uses this strategy as well. He uses it in all of our lives. You know, Satan exploits your weaknesses. He exploits my weaknesses. You know, you and I may not struggle with many different areas of sin, but there may be that one little area in your life that you struggle with. And where are you tempted the most in your life? Is it in all the areas that you have no trouble with? Or is it usually in that area that you struggle with? You know, now your your temptation may be in the area of, of lying. It might be in the area of materialism. It might be in the area of lust or pornography or gossip or overeating or materialism. We could go on down the list. And you may look at one of these lists and you say, you know what? I don't have a problem with nine out of those ten. But that one area is where I get hit all the time. And it seems to me that Satan is always tempting me in that area. And I wish, and I, this, I'm speaking for myself right here. I wish that Satan would tempt me in the nine out of ten areas that I don't have a problem in. I mean, I would be the most victorious Christian on the face of the earth. But that's not where I get tempted. You know what? I get tempted in the one area that I have the most problems with. And that is because Satan exploits my weaknesses, just as he exploits your weaknesses. Well, you know, the same thing is true when you come to the corporate assembly of believers, the church. Satan exploits the weaknesses in the church. Now, Before we get to Jude this morning, and we're continuing on our study of Jude, I want you to flip over to Hebrews chapter 12 for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 12. This is all by way of introduction. Hebrews chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews gives us some profound wisdom, instructions, advice here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. He says this, Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak, and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. So as Satan exploits your weaknesses as an individual believer, what are you supposed to do? Well, number one, identify your weakness. Find out, where am I weak? What area of my life do I struggle with? Do I have problems with? And in that area of my life, I need to strengthen the hands that are weak. I need to strengthen the knees that are feeble. And look at verse 13. And make straight paths for your feet, so the limb which is lame. Now, I want you to understand something. The Bible assumes that you have a limb that is lame. There's an assumption here. It's not saying if you have a limb or a leg or an ankle that has been turned. It's saying you've got one. You know why? Because all of us have weaknesses. We all have areas of weaknesses that Satan exploits. And you say, well, you know, is it devil making me do it all the time? No, it's not. You know, if there were no Satan, and I believe there is a Satan, there is a devil. But, you know, if there were not, we would have as much problem with our own sin nature as anything else. And so if Satan were not exploiting you in your area of weakness, your own sin would be exploiting you in that area of weakness. And so what the Bible is saying here is this, is if you're going to have victory over this at all, you need to identify the weakness, you need to strengthen the weakness, and then don't go where that weakness is going to be exploded. exploited. Look at verse 13. And make straight paths for your feet so the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. In other words, if you've got a turned ankle... Josh, I, I understand you hurt something, right? What did you hurt? You sprained your ankle. Okay, so it would not be a good idea for you today to drop the crutches and start walking up the sandias on a rocky trail, would it? Because what would you do to your ankle? 
you'd hurt it again. So the best thing for you to do is to use your crutches and walk on some nice, straight paths, right? Or else you're going to hurt it again. Well, you know, that's the, the idea. We identify what our weaknesses are. We strengthen those weaknesses. And then we don't choose avenues of life that are going to cause those weaknesses to be exploited and for us to damage that limb again. Now, again, I, I told you that what is true of individuals is also going to be true of the church. Churches have weaknesses. Satan exploits the church in the same way that he exploits individuals. And you know what the weakness in the church today is? Oh, some people are going to say, what's well, love? No, it's not love. They're going to say, oh, it's, 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 it's worship. No, it's not really worship. You know, let me tell you what the big weakness in the church of Jesus Christ today. It's in the area of doctrine. We are basically biblically and theologically illiterate in the church of Jesus Christ today. We don't know what is in this book from cover to cover. We have no idea. Most believers today have never read this book. And I won't even take a poll here today and find out. But most believers in the church of Jesus Christ today are biblically illiterate. They don't know what's in here. They're theologically illiterate. They don't understand how to connect the dots of what's in here. And that's where Satan is exploiting the church of Jesus Christ today. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, just, just by way of introduction, we're not where we're going to be today, but we're getting there. Just like we're not who we are going to be someday, but we're getting there, right? 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, okay, we are in the latter times, if, if you have wondered, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. I want you to understand something, first and foremost, as we talk about false doctrine today and false teachers. Any doctrine that does not square with the Word of God is not only false doctrine, it is doctrine that proceeds from demons. Do you understand that? We have this idea in our age of tolerance today that you can believe whatever you want, you can teach whatever you want, and you know, as long as you're sincere and as long as you're true to yourself and true to what you believe, it's okay. And we'll just tolerate everything. Understand that if it doesn't square with Scripture, that it's going to be a doctrine that is, is demonic. Now, am I talking about those areas that, that Christians honestly disagree over? No, I'm not talking about those areas. There are areas in the Word of God that we have honest disagreements over. And you have believers on both sides that know the Lord, they love the Lord, and they disagree on these issues. We're talking about the fundamentals of the faith. When you start talking about the deity of Christ, when you start talking about the virgin birth of Christ, when you start talking about whether there's a real, literal hell, when you start talking about whether or not Christ is going to come back, when you talk about many of those things, which we consider the fundamentals of the faith, to pervert those doctrines is to provide a doctrine that comes straight out of the pit of hell. Now look at verse 2. By means of hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Now look at verse 6. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Let's stop there for just a second. There is an idea today that if a pastor in the church begins to point out the negative in the church or begins to warn Christians about false teaching and false teachers and things that aren't right, that he is just negative and he doesn't love people and he's not doing what he ought to do. Listen to what the Bible says. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. Constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Now, I want you to look at the end of verse 6. Sound doctrine does what for believers? It nourishes us. What's the word nourish mean? Strengthens us. It feeds us. It builds us up. Well, if sound doctrine and doctrine, again, you have some people that say we don't need doctrine. Folks, doctrine means teaching. We need doctrine. We need teaching. The Bible says, Jesus said this in his great prayer in John 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is what? Truth. We've got to know the word of God. So we've got to have teaching. Teaching is doctrine. Sound doctrine nourishes us. Well, if sound doctrine nourishes us, what does false doctrine do to us? 
destroys us, weakens us, makes us unhealthy. It starves us. What does incomplete doctrine do? Same thing. Incomplete doctrine does the same thing. You know, here's what false doctrine, weak doctrine, and incomplete doctrine make us easy pickings for false teachers and false teaching. There's two great weaknesses that I see in the church of Jesus Christ today. Number one, as I said, we're biblically and theologically illiterate. And number two, we don't like to think. We don't like to think, do we? You know, the problem is, is that we have become so dumbed down by television and video or experiential video technology. Read video games. Okay? I'm not saying they're all wrong. I'm just saying we've been dumbed down by some of these things and by a church culture that feeds on positive emotional experiences that believers find thinking about their faith and thinking about the Scriptures and thinking about their God to be boring. I mean, you talk to, to many believers in many churches today and, and they don't want to think about the Scriptures. Just give me an emotional experience. I come to church not to think. I come to church to feel. Tell you what, if you come to church to feel and you don't come to church to think, you're in trouble. Because there's a lot going on in church today that will make you feel good that is wrong. We don't think anymore. We're not biblically literate anymore. We're not theologically literate anymore. And I tell you what, that's a dangerous combination to be theologically and intellectually lazy. It really is. Interestingly enough, George Barna, I have a love-hate relationship with George Barna. I love the statistics that he comes up with about the church. What I don't appreciate about George Barna is his pushing of what's called the market-driven, seeker-driven church in which you remove the hard stuff of doctrine, give people what they want to hear, and you build the church. So I don't like that. But here's what's interesting. He wrote a book a few years ago called Marketing the Church in which he taught pastors how to build a big church. You market it. You find what people are interested in and that's what you give the people and you will build a great big church. Well, he went back a couple years ago and he researched the results of what came out of those kind of churches. And he wrote another book called Boiling Point. And this is the critique that he gave on Christians that are coming out of market-driven, seeker-driven church. Listen to what he says. Few of these Christians coming out of the market-driven, seeker-driven church currently have the intellectual and spiritual tools to identify and reject the garbage. Do you understand what he's saying there? He said, as a result of this whole market-driven philosophy where you just give Christians what they want and you, you, you basically cater to their felt needs, but you don't worry about teaching the Word of God, you now have Christians, professing Christians, who can't even identify what's false. They don't even know the difference between what's garbage and what's good to eat. And so they eat everything. He went on to say this about the purely felt needs and non-doctrinal sermons heard in most of these churches, that the church is rotting from the inside out, crippled by a biblical theology. What he means is there's no theology. There's no doctrine. Here's the problem when you simply preach to people's felt needs. You come in here and you say, you know, Mark, I need a sermon that's going to make me feel good about my acne. Or I need a sermon that's going to make me feel good about my job. Or it's going to make me feel good about my wife. Or it's going to make me feel good about my husband. I just need a job that's going to get me up and get me going. Now, you know, the Bible will deal with those subjects. There, there's times where the Bible deals with those subjects. But if that's all you ever hear... That's all you ever hear. And you never get through the whole Bible and you start connecting the dots of the doctrine that's taught in the Word of God. You are going to end up being a very weak and soft and fat Christian. You're going to... When I say fat, fat because you're going to end up being eating junk food all the time. But you're not going to be balanced in any way, shape, or form. That's why Paul told Timothy the church needs to be nourished on what? Sound doctrine. Well, let's go to Jude. We're about in our sixth week in the book of Jude. It only has 25 verses. We're moving through it fairly slowly. We spent three weeks on verse 12. We're going to cover a bigger section today. We're going to, I mean, verse 11 we spent three weeks. We're going to cover verses 12 through 19 this morning. And what we're going to see are five defensive tactics that will keep us from falling prey to false teachers. Five defensive tactics that will keep us as individual Christians and us as a church from falling prey to false teachers and false teaching. Jude, 
verses 12 through 19. Let's look at verse 3 and set the, the whole scene of what's happened in June. Jude writes, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. This is what this whole book is about. The fact that believers are to contend for the faith. If you remember what that word meant, it was a word that was used in wrestling back in Paul's day in which one wrestler would grab a hold of the other wrestler and would not let that wrestler go no matter what. He would hold on to that wrestler no matter how much pain he was in. And he would hold on until he won. Well, what the Bible is telling us is that as believers, it's necessary for us to hold on to the truth of God's Word and never let it go regardless of what happens to us. Regardless of what people think. Regardless of what people do to us. Regardless of what people think about us. We've got to get a hold of this book. A hold of God's Word and never let it go. And part of the problem we're having today is getting a good hold on it. Let me tell you, you can't get a good hold on this book unless you spend time in this book. That's how we get a good hold of what's in this book. And throughout the book, Jude is telling us the dangers of false teachers. This is why we need to contend for the faith. And here in verses 12 through 19, we're going to see five principles or five defensive tactics that help us contend for the faith. Before we ever do anything positive, these are the things that need to be in place in our mind by way of of defensive tactics or by way of a mindset. Now, here's the first one. Let's look at verse 12. He's talking about the false teachers and he says this. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. What he's getting across here to the people that he's writing to is this. The false teachers are the men who are already in your church. They're already in your love feasts. They're already fellowshipping with you. And so here's the first defensive tactic. Believers who intend to contend for the faith must not live in denial. Believers who intend to contend for the faith must not live in denial. False teachers and false teaching has already infiltrated the church and is running rampant among us right now. You know, you're, you only have your head buried in the sand if you don't see and recognize false teaching in the church today. And don't understand there are false teachers in the church today. And if you're one of those kinds of people that thinks everything is hunky-dory, you're living in denial. And here's the problem. You're not identifying the weakness. You're not identifying that there is a problem. You know, whose, whose yard should we be cleaning up? The world's or ours? Ours first, right? You know, we, you know, Howard Hendricks says this, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, don't export it. Right? Why export a Christianity that does not work at home? What you should you be doing? Let's make sure this works at home. Well, it's the same thing with the church. If it's not working in the church, let's don't export it. Let's get it straight. Then let's take it to the world. Now, am I saying that, we'll, that we don't ever take it to the world? No, we do. But we need to get it straight in our own backyards first. Believers who intend to contend for the faith must not live in denial. Look at it. It says, these are. The word are. It's a helping verb. In Greek, it's in what's called the present indicative. Well, what that means in Greek language is simply this. This is happening right now. This is not a possibility. This is not a probability. This is indicative of the situation right now. So what Jude is saying is these are the men who are right now in your assemblies. They're right now in your churches. Not only the men, but the false teaching is right now present in our churches. Go with me to 2 Peter, if you would. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and, and Jude are uh, very similar. You've got to read both of those. Read the ch- second chapter of 2 Peter and the book of Jude, and you're going to say, man, I think they copied from each other. It's interesting. But listen to what 2 Peter 2 1 says. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. Now, Peter is saying the the false teachers are coming. Jude is saying they're here. But I want you to notice what Peter says. They are going to be where? Among 
you. They're going to be among you. Look with me at Matthew chapter 7 for just a moment. Matthew chapter 7. Do you need to go to where false teaching is taught? No. Look at this. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who what? Come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We've got to quit living in denial. There's a spiritual war going on and Satan is not sitting passive. He raises up false teachers and false teaching and he attacks the church because, again, what's our greatest area of weakness? Sound doctrine. And so Satan is exploiting the church today with all kinds of false teachers and false teaching. We need to not live in denial and recognize that the false teaching, the false teachers is going on in churches right now. Now, look back at Jude. Look at the verse again. It says, these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. I want you to understand. He's saying they're not only attending services, they are in your love feast. Now, the love feast was connected to the communion meal, the Lord's table. They would have communion or they would have the love feast, one or the other first. But the love feast is when they came together as an intimate assembly of believers that loved each other and cared for each other and were going to minister to each other and they shared a meal together. Now, do you understand what he's saying? These false teachers are not simply on the fringe of the church. They're in it. They're in the intimate part of the church. The false teaching has got to the heart of where the church is at. So don't think that, you know, when we look at the church today that, yeah, there's false teachers, there's false teaching, but, you know, it's on the fringe. It's really out on the outside. No, the Bible says it is on the inside. It is in the core group of the church. And look what it says, when they feast with you. So, again, the first point is this. Believers who intend to contend for the faith must not live in denial. Realize we have a weakness. And that weakness is we have false teaching and we have false teachers in our midst. Now, how do you identify false teaching? And how do you identify false teachers? How? Okay, fruits. You look at their fruits. We'll talk about that some. You look at the fruits. We'll see that in Matthew chapter 7. But what's the best way? The Word. What did the Bereans do? Study the Word to see if what you're saying is really true. This is the ruler. This is the standard. So whoever you hear, you take what they hear and you say, okay, let's see if it's really in here. Myself included. Yourself included. Don't simply just assume that because they say they're a Christian that what they're saying is true. Now, see, that's another problem we have today. We'll hear these celebrities get on TV and someone will ask them, Robert Shaw, I won't say Robert Shaw, he does it a lot on his show, and he'll he'll talk and he'll say, oh, let's talk about your relationship with the Lord. And, And they'll say, yeah, I love Jesus. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, will you tell us, you know, give us some words of wisdom and all that? And they'll spiel a bunch of new age junk. And because he said, I love Jesus, everybody thinks, well, he must be a Christian because everybody that says they love Jesus is a Christian. False. False. Satan's not stupid. That leads us to the next principle. Look at the rest of verse 12. It says, these are men who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you. Look at the next. Without fear. I love this. Without, they don't have any fear of you. That's amazing. They, they should be. They should be. Without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Now, when, when you see a cloud, especially here in the southwest, this, we're particularly sensitive to this, when the summertime, it's dry, and you see the dark clouds coming in, what are you hoping for? And when those clouds pass you by and there's no rain, what do you think? They promised, but they didn't deliver. When you grow an orchard and you've got apple trees and autumn comes, or in the spring you've got the blooms on the trees and you're waiting for fruit and autumn comes and you go out there and there's no fruit. The worms got it. The birds got it. The frost got it. Promised, but didn't deliver. The idea is that the false teachers will promise you a great deal. They will promise you everything your lustful flesh desires and say it's okay. But they can't deliver on their promises. The only way we can know whether the promises are from the Word of God or from Satan is do we use discernment. So number one, we can't be in denial. But number two, believers who intend to contend for the faith must not check their brains or their doctrinal discernment at the church door. Believers who intend to contend for the faith must not check their brains 
or their doctrinal discernment at the church door. Keep in mind, all of these promises are being made in church. They're in the church and they're saying, listen, we promise you all these things. The problem is they can't deliver on those promises. We see Christians fall for these things. We'll look at some of the promises here in a little bit. Christians will fall for these things because they check their brains at the door. See, one of the problems we have in the church again today is that we've, we've made this swing to an emotional experience. We want to replace the Word of God because, you know, after all, folks, it gets kind of boring just reading. You know, I need to feel something. And so we want emotions built into everything. And the thing about emotions, the emotions are very strong and they will move us in many different ways. And when we replace the intellect with the emotions, we're in trouble. And a lot of people go to church and they check their brains at the door and they check their doctrinal discernment at the door and they shouldn't do that. Let me, let me ask you this. If, if you heard about a preacher who believes that a person can be saved apart from hearing about Jesus or hearing the gospel, would you agree with that? Most of you are saying, no, no. You, you've got to know Jesus, right? I mean, what is the name? Who, who, who do we... Who saves us? What is the name under heaven that we must come to? Jesus. We've got to hear the gospel. How can you be saved if you don't know you're lost, right? How can you receive sight if you don't know you're blind, right? Okay, most of us would be on the same page here. Well, consider this. And, and, and I hesitate to use this example because I, I, I really appreciate this man. And I respect this man. And he has done a great world of good but he's also made some very big mistakes. I don't think this man is a false teacher, but I think he has swallowed some false teaching. In 1978, McCall Magazine interviewed Billy Graham. He was quoted as saying, I used to believe that pagans in far countries were lost if they did not have the gospel of Christ preached to them. I no longer believe that. This, of course, was met with fierce opposition by the Christian community. And so the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association said, no, he was misquoted. That's not what he meant. Well, on May 31st, 1997, via a television link up to a service with Robert Schuler, who is a false teacher, by the way. He is a false teacher. He said this when Robert Schuler asked him this question. What will the final makeup of the body of Christ be? And here's what Billy Graham said. That body will be made up from all the Christian groups around the world and even those outside the Christian groups. Everybody that loves or knows Christ, whether they are conscious of loving or knowing Christ or not, are members of the body of Christ. How can you not be conscious of knowing Christ? How can you not be conscious of loving Christ? Do you, do you understand? We, we hear a big name and, and preaching and all these different things. And yet, when you try to find out what, what, what's he saying, what's he believe, there's things that are wrong. But see, we'll accept it unless we start thinking about it. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that. The Apostle James, this is what Billy's Graham is saying, in the first council in Jerusalem when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. And that is what he's doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they be the Muslim world, the Buddhist world, or the non-believing world. They're members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. Now, I agree. God calls people out of all these different groups to be part, to come to him. Sounds like, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's what we believe. But there's the response part, right? You know, don't, don't go to the extreme of Calvinism. You said God calls, and so you know, there's no response needed. There's no responsibility for man to respond to the gospel. You just become a heretic on that side. God does call. The Bible tells us that. But what does man's got to do? Respond. You've got to respond to the gospel, right? Or you don't get saved, correct? Listen to what he says. They may not know the name of Jesus but they know in their hearts that they need something they do not have and they turn to the only light they have and I think that they are saved and that they are going to be with us in heaven. Now, understand what he's saying. You don't need to know the name of Jesus. What does Acts 4.12 says? Let's look at Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Let's, let's use, lose a little discernment here. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else for there is no other what? Name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. He says they know in their hearts that they need something they do not have. Look at Acts chapter 2 for just a second. Look at Acts chapter 2. I know I'm going fast. My time is going fast. 
Look at Acts chapter 2. Okay, this whole idea, they need something. They realize they need something that they don't have, and so that's going to save you. Okay, if you realize you're lost, does that save you? What do you need to do? Come to Christ, right? Just because you realize you're lost and that you need a Savior does not save you. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter is preaching, and these people here at the day of Pentecost, in verse 37, respond. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? In other words, they knew they needed something. They're pierced to the heart. They're convicted about their sin. Did that save them? No. Look what Peter said. Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've got to Repent. The next thing that Mr. Graham said was that they turn to the only light they have and I think they are saved. Let me read to you a quote from a New Age teacher that uh, actually contributes to the New Age Journal. Her name is Lynn Williford. Billy Graham fell right into her hands and so she wrote this article. And Here's what she said in an article entitled Why I Went Back to the Church After 30 Years. She writes that she rediscovered Christianity in a freedom and justice United Methodist Church At times, she says, it feels like my chest has been filled with a golden light. A friend who follows Eastern religion says, I'm illuminating my heart. I think that I'm tapping into the source, but listen to this, but whatever the name, I'm just glad to be back. Do you understand what she's saying? I went back and whatever the name, I'm tapping into the light. This is the light that I have and this is why I've I've come back to Christianity. Well, let me ask you this. What's one of Satan's name? He is an angel of light. False teaching. False teachers. Even some of those that we may, we may respect a great deal fall into this without using discernment. Here, let me give you the rest of the interview. Surprised by this, Schuler. I mean, he was ecstatic. He was dribbling all over himself. Was anxious for clarification. What? What? I hear you saying that it's possible for Jesus Christ to come into human hearts and souls and lives even if they have been born into darkness and have never had exposure to the Bible or the Christ of the Bible. Is this a correct interpretation of what you're saying? Yes, it is, Graham responded. At which point Schuler exclaimed, I'm so thrilled to hear you say this. There is a wideness in God's mercy. Now, I want to ask you a question. You tell me what verse contradicts that in the Bible. How wide is the way? Look with me over at Matthew chapter 7 for just a moment. Matthew chapter 7. Let's see, we may have to divide this message into three parts. Look at Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads where? To destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. Do you see the weaknesses that Satan is exploiting in the church today? Because doctrinally, we are weak. Biblically, we're illiterate. I'm not saying us. I think that as a church, we, 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 we really put an emphasis on studying God's Word and knowing what the Bible teaches. But for the most part in Christianity, that's the way it is. Number three, let's go back to Jude. We'll see, get through this as much as we can. Number three, believers who intend to contend for the faith must not become discouraged thinking that the seemingly present success of false teachers and their teaching equates with God's blessing. Just because you see a church that has gone through 10 building programs and is still growing, does that mean that that church is receiving God's blessing? Not necessarily. You keep in mind that in the Word of God, big never equates with blessing, does it? God uses what kind of things? Little, foolish. Now, it doesn't mean because you're little you're blessed either. Or because you're foolish, you're blessed either. But don't fall into the trap of thinking that success is equatable or equivocable with God's blessing. That is not necessarily the case. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not the case either. But you've got to look a little bit deeper than just at a success rate to see if someone is receiving God's blessing. Look at verse 13, verse 14. What's was the second part of 13. Wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars. Okay, this is what the false teachers are like. They're like wandering stars. In other words... They don't stay any place long. They don't stay on any 
teaching long. They've got to keep moving. They've got to keep changing their pitch, changing their delivery, changing what they're talking about. Because they've got to keep you what? Hooked. And they know we get bored pretty fast. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. There's another part about being a wandering star. When you, back in the days when you used to navigate by the stars, what would a wandering star do to your navigation results? Mess you up. Can you imagine the North Star moving? We'd all be screwed up. Well, if you are banking on false teachers for your direction in life, guess what? You're in a mess. You can't find where you're going if you're banking on what they're teaching. Now look, it says, for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. What's he talking about? Hell. God has reserved hell for false teachers because they're unbelievers. They're unbelievers. Remember, we talked about the distinction between false teachers and Christians who teach false things. Listen, if you've done any teaching at all for any length of time, you have probably taught something you shouldn't have taught. Not a one of us, James says, has a perfect tongue, right? Right? We all screw things up. Does that make you a false teacher? No. The motivation, why you're doing what you're doing, how you're doing what you're doing, never coming to repentance, that's what makes you a false teacher. Plus the fact that a false teacher is an unbeliever. We'll see that in just a moment. But notice the black darkness has been reserved forever for them. Look at verse 14. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, this is Enoch, the one that was transported to heaven, translated to heaven, in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, we don't have a book called Enoch. There is an apocryphal book which bears Enoch's name where this quote actually comes from, in part. That does not mean that that apocryphal book is supposed to be part of the Bible. It just means that there's also truth in other books. But it doesn't mean that it ever passed the test of canon and that we have this missing book of the Bible. This is something that Enoch did say. And it was passed along from generation to generation. And this is the quote. He actually prophesies about the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ, when Christ is going to come back as a warrior, and what is he going to do, according to Revelation chapter 19? Destroy Antichrist. Destroy the armies that are coming against him. He's going to destroy unbelievers. He's going to judge them. What he's talking about is the second coming and the judgment that is going to come at the second coming. And what he's saying is simply that these men are going to be judged with unbelievers on that day. Why? Because they are unbelievers. Now, what I want you to understand here is this. We tend to look at immediate success, immediate gratification of people and say, wow, God's blessing them. And what Jude is saying here is this. Guys, a day is coming when they will be judged and they will be judged ferociously for what they have done. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Let's look at that day for just a moment. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Yes, we are to be fruit inspectors. Yes, we are to use discernment. And when we see people, we are to look at their fruit and discern whether or not they're a true believer or not. Or whether or not they're a true or false teacher or not. Look at what their life produces. Look at what their teaching produces. But look at this. Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody that prays to Jesus is going to heaven. It's not so. Not everybody that gets up on a platform and leads an eloquent prayer is going to heaven. Not everybody that calls upon the Lord in this way is going to heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now, what's he saying there? What he's saying is this. If you are a true believer, 
James tells us there will be what? Works that authenticate that belief. If you are a false believer, there will not be any works to authenticate that belief. And so you can say, Lord, Lord, all you want. But you know what? If you don't have the fruit that is supposed to be produced by a true profession of faith in Jesus, Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. Not because you don't have fruit, but because you're not truly saved. That's what he's saying. Just because you pray the prayer doesn't make you a believer. Just because you walk the aisle doesn't make you a true believer. You know, I heard Greg Laurie preaching this week. And uh, one thing he said I, I thought was outstanding. He said, how will you know whether you're a believer? How will you know whether I'm a believer? You know what his answer was? Time will tell. Time will tell. Time will either show the fruit or not show the fruit. And time will also show whether I persevere in the faith because only those who persevere in the faith are going to go to heaven. The Bible says if you don't persevere in the faith, it means what? You were never truly saved because those who are truly saved will persevere till the end. Time will tell. Well, listen to what else he says. Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Now, I want you to understand this. These guys are shocked that they're not going to heaven. They are standing before the Lord and they can't believe that they're not going in. In other words, they, they have so deceived others, they're deceived themselves. False teachers are the most deceived people on the face of the earth. They actually think that they are going to heaven. So when they're meeting the Lord here and he says, you're not going in, they can't believe this. They are shocked. And they're saying, but, but we prophesize. We, we cast out demons. We perform many miracles. We forget today that Satan has a great counterfeit system working today. I mean, that's what the whole story about Moses was about back in Egypt. Moses and Aaron would do a miracle and what would Pharaoh's magicians do? A very good counterfeit too. Very close. I mean, it was off. They couldn't do all that God could do. Certainly couldn't. But man, they sure came close, didn't they? And so these guys are, are saying, man, you, you can't do this. And look at verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. A day is coming when false teachers, when those Christians, when those, not Christians, when those people who have followed false teaching will be judged. You have many that look successful today. And the Bible says, don't look at today. You need to wait until the end. Remember the, the parable we talked about last week? The, the, the wheat and the tares? And the farmer said, don't pull the tares out while the wheat's still there. Wait until the harvest time and then we'll separate them. That's because at some point in its existence, the tear looks an awful lot like the wheat. And only God can tell the difference. You know, my fear sometimes is that for us, and I examine my own life. We're told in 2 Corinthians 13.5 to examine ourselves, see from the faith. My fear is, is, is that some of us will not be at the Bama seat, we'll be at the great white throne because we've been deceived. And we've deceived ourselves. And that's why the Bible gives us these benchmarks and says fruit. Here's the fruit. You need to look. Do you have this fruit? Is the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Are you growing in Christ? Is there a desire to know God's Word? Is there a desire to glorify Jesus Christ? Is there a desire to exalt Christ? Do you enjoy God? Do you enjoy being with God's people? All kinds of benchmarks along the way. And he says you need to measure yourself by these things to see if you're really in the faith or not. You know, and we'll close with this point. We'll, we'll divide this one up. In the early years of the church, after the great persecution when uh, true Christians watched as the church became a pagan institution, Constantinople went ahead and legalized Christianity. Now keep in mind that until that point, first 300 years of church history, Christianity was illegal. Nobody wanted to be in the church unless you were a real Christian. Once it was legalized, everybody wanted in the church because it was now the legal religion of the empire. And so if you wanted to be safe, you needed to come into Christianity and come under that umbrella. So all kinds of religions came in under the name of Christianity. 
That's how we got the mess that we have today. But the true Christians looked at all this and they saw this church becoming big and successful, the Roman Catholic Church. That's what the institutionalized church was. That's what it became. And this is what they said in Latin as they watched it becoming huge and successful and as they watched their own little fellowships being persecuted and destroyed and, and put out there into the field, the pasture. They said this in Latin, post tenebras lux. Post tenebras lux. You know what it means? After darkness, light. In other words, they realized that even though they saw a huge success, that the real light would not show up until after the darkness. They knew that regardless of how successful the church in Rome became or appeared, that the day would come when the darkness would once again be overcome by God's light. You know, and that's what we've got to remember as well. You know, if, if you are concerned at all about the faith, if you're concerned at all about the church, and I am, you know, I look at my messages, I look at the, the, what I preach, and I know that one of the things that I probably harp on the most is doctrinal integrity and churches that follow the Word of God and preachers that, preachers that follow the Word of God. And that's because I'm concerned for the church of Jesus Christ. I, I have a burden that the church of Jesus Christ be pure and that the Word of God be taught purely. That's what my burden is. But you know, whenever you have that concern, I know many of you have that concern, you will pay the price for that concern. And you will pay the price in the church, not outside of the church. When you have a concern for doctrinal purity, you will pay the price with other believers who don't have that same concern. It's not going to be easy for the person, the man, the woman, who decides to stand for the truth in a church culture that has all but abandoned the truth and can't even recognize it if it saw it. I want to just give you three quotes, four quotes, and then we're going to close with this, from some men who did fight the battle, who did contend for the faith. And I don't agree with everything that they said or did, but they did fight for the fundamentals of the faith. And listen to what they said, and listen to the cost that was involved. John Wesley said this, to all pastors who failed to take their stand with the Scriptures against false teaching of his day, he said this, you dare not because you have respect of persons. You fear the faces of men. You cannot because you have not overcome the world. You are not above the desire of earthly things and it is impossible till you desire nothing more than God. In other words, until your desire for God is greater than your desire for the things of the world, you will never take a stand for the Word of God. You'll never contend for the faith. Martin Luther said this, those who are in the teaching office should teach with the greatest faithfulness and expect no other remuneration than to be killed by the world, trampled underfoot, and despised by their own. Men, teach purely and faithfully. And in all you do, expect not glory, but dishonor and contempt. Not wealth, but poverty, violence, prison, death, and every danger. Boy, if... if People were promised that when they came out of Bible college and seminary. How many would be in church doing ministry today, right? Whoa. Dr. Joseph, Joseph Milner, you've probably never heard of this man. He wrote in 1794 something that I think is very profound. Listen to what he said. I feel the need to pray continually, lest I be carried away by the civilities of the world. We began as despised preachers of Jesus. In meekness and simplicity, May we continue so to the end. We began as despised people, didn't we? Weren't Christians despised? And rejected? And maligned? Weren't they persecuted for their faith? What's changed? Has the world got better? No. Who changed? We changed. We changed. We needed to fit in because we treasure the world more than we treasure God Himself. You know, I was reminded that the other night Scott and I were talking, we were having dinner and uh, up at Santa Fe, and I was just mentioning to him something which shocked me later, my surprise. I was just kind of voicing my surprise to him that the other officers didn't want to fellowship with me. Didn't want to, you know, when we come in for meals, it's very obvious, isn't it? We walk in and it's like, well, here's Scott and I. 
Or when he's not there, it's just me, and you walk in, and maybe you got your Bible or not. Or even without, you don't have your Bible, but there's just a definite, you stay there, we'll all gather over here. And I was saying to him, you know, isn't it kind of strange? And, 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 and Scott was basically giving back to me, well, why are you surprised? <laughs> you know? And he's like, yeah, you're, you're right. Now, I'm not saying that we, we should make ourselves obnoxious, but you know what? If we don't stand out as different, then we've put a bushel over our light. We really have. And sad to say, even in the church of Jesus Christ, if we don't stand out as different, we've probably put a bushel over our light as well. If you're going to contend for the faith, you can't be in denial. You've got to realize the church is in sad shape today. False teaching has arrived. It's here. Number two, you can't check your brains and your doctrinal discernment at the door. And number three, don't be discouraged by flashy shows. Don't be discouraged by the success rate of false teachers and false teaching and wondering why everybody goes there and so few really care to hear the Word of God. Don't be discouraged by that. One day God is going to judge those who chose the wide way instead of the narrow way. And we need to stay true. Post tenebris lux. Light comes after darkness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the time we had. And and, uh, obviously you had other plans. I was hoping to finish the whole thing. And uh, perhaps this is where you want us to end today. And this is what you want to impact upon our lives today. And I pray that, Father, we would... Be those that are willing to contend for the faith and fight for what is true. To grab a hold of the truth for all we're worth and not let it go. Regardless of what people do or say or think about us or regardless of what we hear. That we would use the discernment that you've given us to go to the Word of God and check it out and see, is this true or is this not true? Father, cause us to be as the Bereans. Those that go to the Word daily to check out what your truth is. I pray, Father, that we'd get a handle on our Bibles, a handle on the Word of God, and that we would strengthen the hands and the knees that are weak. That, Father, we would strengthen the lame, the limb that is lame and make straight paths for it, that Satan may not exploit our weaknesses and certainly not exploit us in this area of doctrinal weakness. Cause us to be people of the book. Cause us to be people that love you and treasure you so much and enjoy you so much that the world is fading away. In Jesus' name, amen.